Good morning, everyone. We'll give about a, two minutes. It is 9.59. Um, we'll give everyone two minutes. There's about 500 attendees. So we'll give everyone a chance to log in and get themselves settled and we'll get started. As you come in, this is a webinar version of um, Zoom, so everyone will be on mute. Um, you can utilize the Q&A. If you do have questions, you can utilize the Q&A box. Give about 30 more seconds and we'll get started. Good morning. Good morning, everyone that's coming in. We'll get started in about 10 more seconds. All right. Good morning and welcome. My name is Alicia Serene Wells. I am the Associate Commissioner for Audit Resolution here at EEC. And thank you for joining us for the Setting Up for Success Child Care Stabilization Grant Compliance Webinar. The goal of this training is to provide programs who are, in, who are recipients of the C3 grant with the support needed to ensure the understanding of the grant requirements as it relates to the overall grants management. We will also engage in training providers as yourself on how to develop internal processes over the grant funds and provide details on how to be successful during an EEC fiscal monitoring review. In order for the session to run smoothly and to minimize interruptions, all attendees will be on mute. If you have questions or need te technical assistance, please use the Q&A box. We have allotted time for questions and answers at the end of presentations. However, feel free to add questions at any time throughout the session. There will also be a few polls throughout the presentation. We appreciate your participation in these polls as it will further help us understand the support programs need to manage the grant. This slide deck, as well as other material will be made available to all attendees along with the recording of this webinar. These materials will also be translated and posted on the EEC website for easier access. Again, my name is Alicia Saran Wells. Um, for our agenda we have for today, um, we'll be setting the stage as to why we're here. We'll have some acronyms and definitions. I know EEC is so famous for our acronyms. So we wanna make sure that you understand everything that we're talking about today. We're gonna go over some of the compliance with the grants, with the grant, um, expenditure tracking, how to track your expenditures, internal controls. What does it mean to, to have EEC fiscal monitoring? We'll also provide some resources and additional information as well as having a Q&A. I'd like to introduce our speakers for this webinar. EEC has partnered with KPMG in developing the fiscal monitoring process for the stabilization grants. EEC has been working behind the scenes throughout the grant cycle by providing prepayment reviews, as well as analyzing EEC's oversight of the grant requirements and compliance. I will let KPMG's director, Evan Lehm, Lehman, to introduce today's presenters, and we will get started with setting the stage with today's webinar. Evan? Excellent. Thanks, Alicia. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to be here speaking with you all today and sharing some of this information. 
as it relates to the child care stabilization grant. So my name is Evan Lehman. I'm a director here at KPMG, uh, helping lead the effort uh, with supporting EEC in this effort for the monitoring and oversight uh, that we're going to start getting into shortly. So we're excited to speak with you all today and share some of this information, um, you know, as it relates to some of the funds that you all have been receiving and spending so far. Um, the KPMG team that we have supporting EEC, uh, Anthony Trapasso, uh, he's on the line today. He's leading us at the managing director level from KPMG. On the line today, you have myself, Dave Gamelik, Caitlin Carney, Dominique Moran, and Julia Mati. Um, Caitlin and Dominique and Julia will be doing a lot of the presenting today, so we're looking forward to hearing from them. Uh, so we've all got our videos on, so you can kind of put some faces to the names for this call. Um, and then of course, you know, we'll be looking to share some additional uh, responses to questions as they come in towards the end. And we look forward to having a few more of these presentations in some of these, uh, you know, office hour settings uh, in the coming couple of weeks. So I think with that, I'll pass it along to the rest of the KPMG team and we'll get going right into some of the content. Thanks Evan for that. And thank you, Alicia, for the introduction as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia, as Evan mentioned, and today I'm going to be starting off with setting the stage. So next slide, please. So um, before we get really into the meat of this presentation today, we want to sort of to set the stage, give you guys all an understanding kind of what we're doing here, um, kind of what we're trying to explain and set the stage for a lack of better words. So as a recipient of the Child Care Stabilization grant funds, um, you're responsible for ensuring proper use of the grant funds and maintaining appropriate documentation related to the grant fund expenditures. So hopefully you should be spending the grant funds only on allowable uses and also referring to the attestation, which you submitted when you did the grant application um, on maintaining documentation for grant expenditures, um, maintaining appropriate documentation. So next slide, please. So the purpose of this presentation today is really just to remind you of the grant requirements, share some helpful suggestions for complying with the grant requirements, and provide you the opportunity to ask questions on these topics that we touch on today. Um, as you guys probably already know, and I'm sure you already are, you're a qualifying child care provider for receiving the grant funds, which means that you're an existing licensed provider at the time you applied, you're open and available to provide child care services on the date you applied for grant funds, and you're also a funded approved uh, program by EC or run by private schools that otherwise meet the criteria above. So next slide, please. So now we're gonna do polling questions. Um, we just wanted to say, as Alicia had mentioned, this is for participation to further see how you're understanding. There's no right or wrong answer. So please understand this is just um, for participation. So now we've just pulled up the first polling question. Um, so please take a second to read the question. So what type of role do you perform within your child care center? And take a second to um, choose the answer that most applies to you. So we'll give everyone about 20 seconds to do that. Um, again, this is no right or wrong answer. So take a moment to fill out the poll. All right, perfect. So looks like a lot of people here today are administrators. Um, so welcome and owners, educator, we got everyone today. So that's great to hear. Okay, so next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about acronyms and definitions. And, and as Alicia had mentioned previously, EC loves their acronym, acronyms and terms. Um, so, well, I'm not going to go through every single um, uh, de a term and a acronym right at this moment. We're going to be referencing them throughout the presentation, and the other presenters will also be explaining what the acronym is or the term that they're going to be using. So if you might not know uh, a term or an acronym that you see right now in the slides, uh, just rest assured the presenters will explain it when they talk about it. And also um, these presentations will be available in mid-April um, and this will be in the presentation for your reference. So next slide, please. 
All right, next slide. All right, again, more terms we will be referencing and explaining them throughout the presentation. So rest assured, um, we don't get to them right now. So next slide. All right, so now we're gonna go on to our second polling question. So the question is, what are you most interested in learning about today? Um, internal controls, expenditure tracking, overall documentation, attestation, managing multiple funding sources, broad waste and abuse, and I'm not sure, but I'm excited to find out. So again, no right or wrong answer, just take a moment and answer the question um, in the way that it applies to you. So to give everyone um, a little bit of time to fill that out. All right, perfect, great. So a lot of people here are excited to learn about the expenditure tracker, no real documentation, and a lot of, I'm not sure, but I'm excited to find out, which is great. We're happy that everyone's here because we're excited too. All right, next slide, please. All right, we got another polling question. So we're gonna pull this poll up. All right. How much support do you think your organization will need to comply with the child care stabilization grant requirements? And again, just want to emphasize there's no right or wrong answer. Um, just please take a moment to answer the question that most applies to you. So a lot of support, some support, or no support. Um, again, no right or wrong answer. So take a moment to answer the question. All right, some support. Great, no support, Osborne. Looks like we've got an, arrive, uh, an array of answers. That's great to hear. So now we're gonna move on to the next slide. Great, and I think this is gonna be our final polling question. Um, so who from your program currently manages the grant funds and oversees the grant requirements? Just me my organization's fiscal team, my organization's director slash administrator, my organization uses an outside source, a bookkeeper or an accountant. Again, no right or wrong answer. So just take a moment to answer the question the way it applies best to you. All right, looks like a lot of people are just me, but we've got, it's very close, which is great to hear. So um, this will be a presentation that will be, um, will give you a lot of great information. So that we're gonna move on to the next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Dominique, and she's gonna talk to you guys about the allowability of fund expenditures. All right, thank you for kicking us off, Julia. My name is Dominique, and I'm going to start us off with the grant compliance section of the presentation. Um, before we get started here, I just want to remind you all that the requirements we're going to cover today come directly from the federal government. So as a recipient of the Child Care Stabilization Grant, you're expected to comply with, comply with all these requirements. 
With that being said, I'm really excited to speak to all of you today. So let's get started with the allowability of fund expenditures. So as you all likely know, there are seven allowable categories you can spend funds on. As we go through them, please remember that this is the complete list of categories, meaning you can only spend the child care stabilization grant funds on items that fall under these categories. So category number one is personnel salaries and wages. This includes benefits like hiring incentives for new employees and incentives for existing employees. And remember, you can always increase employees compensation, but you cannot decrease employee compensation or furlough employees. The second category is rent, utilities, facilities, maintenance, and insurance. So utilities could be your water and electric bills and facilities maintenance could be something like an air conditioning system. And remember, you're allowed to use funds to perform maintenance and make minor renovations to your facility, but you can't use funds for construction or major renovations as defined here by the Code of Federal Regulations. And I'll give you all a second just to read that definition. So moving on to the third category, this is personal protective equipment, cleaning and other health and safety practices. An example of health and safety practices would be installing a ramp or other accessibility features. Of course, as long as it doesn't meet the definition of construction or major renovations, which we just viewed. The fourth category is equipment and supplies. Um, equipment might include payroll or bookkeeping software and supplies might be materials for children's play and learning. The fifth category is goods and services related to the child care facility, program, and providers, including professional development. So goods might include spare children's clothing and services might include hiring a, a cleaning company to come weekly. The sixth category is mental health services, which you can use for you, your staff, and children in your care. And the last category is past expenses incurred after January 31st, 2020, including COVID-19 related debt. So I just wanna explain here that if you're paying for past expenses, the, ex the expense should still fall into one of the six previously discussed categories. So for example, if you owe rent from last year, this still falls into an allowable category. Right. So now that we're going, done going through those, I wanna remind you all that we have a Q and A box because I know that's, we just covered a lot there. So now we're going to talk about maintenance of documentation um, as it relates to expenditures made with the grant funds. So you may or may not know that EEC can request to review supporting documentation for grant expenditures at any time. So because of this, you want your documentation to always be ready for outside review. And to be in good shape, you should consider keeping a tracker of all expenditures made with child care stabilization grant funds. And some of you might already have an expenditure tracker that you use, and that's awesome. But if you don't already have something like this, don't worry because um, we have a tracker we're gonna go through later in this presentation that will also be shared with you in mid or late April. And um, I also wanna call out that we know this grant program has been going on for months now and we hope you've already been following these processes, but if not, you should begin um, doing so from here on out. So you might be wondering what is adequate supporting documentation, right? Um, supporting documentation should accurately capture proof of expenditure, which could vary by the type of expenditure. So for example, payroll benefits and paid leave time is one of the allowable categories we previously discussed. And appropriate, appropriate supporting documentation here might be payroll and benefit records from a payroll report or ledger, as well as employee time cards and pay stubs. Another allowable expenditure category is rent and mortgage payments, which might be evidenced by contractual agreements or checks paid to landlords or the bank. Uh, for operating costs and utilities, you might have statements from your utility companies. And for maintenance, you might have paid invoices or receipts of, from purchases of materials and supplies. For program materials, such as educational supplies and toys, you might have an electronic receipt from somewhere like Amazon or a paper receipt from a more traditional retailer like Walmart. 
Uh, that being said, keep in mind, you should be able to readily produce appropriate supporting documentation at any time in order to satisfy state or federal review requests. So now that we've talked about the allowable expenditure categories and maintenance of documentation, we're going to talk about tracking expenditures made with the grant funds. So while you're required to keep supporting documentation, we strongly suggest you also have a template where you can record basic information about each expenditure, including things like the date, the dollar amount, which of the seven allowable grant categories the expenditure fell under, which we just discussed, and the form of supporting documentation on file for the expenditure, like a receipt or a payroll ledger. So again, if you already have a template like this, that's awesome. And we want to ensure, we want you to ensure that you have all data elements present in this table, the present within your tracker for the most complete tracking. And if you don't already have a template, again, that's totally fine because we're going to provide you with one um, through the lead portal, likely in mid to late April. So we're actually going to walk through our template right now. And while this is getting pulled up, I'll say, that we actually have two versions of our expenditure tracker. The first one, um, which we're actually going to go through is in a Microsoft Excel version, but we also have a Microsoft Word version, which is printer friendly for those of you who prefer to handwrite things rather than use online documents. Um, the, content, the content between the two documents is pretty much identical, but the instructions, which you'll see here, um, are tailored to the specific version you're using. So the instructions, which you should be able to see on screen, uh, really take you step by step through the document. And for the sake of this presentation, we're not going to read everything, but uh, we definitely suggest you read these in detail before you use the tracker. I do want to point out that if you could scroll down a little, please. Um, the instructions define the seven allowable categories so you don't forget them. And um, these are the same seven categories we previously discussed. But staying on this page, I do want to take you through all the required fields of this template, which is just a little lower. Thank you. Awesome. So the first column is transaction number. And this is simply a way to keep track of each transaction. So when we look at the actual template later, you'll see numbers 1 through 25 pre-populated. And you won't be able to change those numbers. But if you have more than 25 transactions for the month, then you can add more rows. And again, we'll actually look at a populated template so you see what I'm talking about. That brings us to the second column, which is the tracker data entry date. This is simply just the date you're inputting the expenditure into the tracker. Now, ideally, you'll be inputting the expenditure into the tracker on the same date you made the purchase, but we know you're all very busy, so this might not always be the case. Um, just as best practice, you should try to input the expenditure in the tracker as soon as you have time to do so. The third column here is expense payment date. And this is simply the date you actually made the purchase, whether it was going to the store and getting supplies or paying an invoice for goods received. The next column is expenditure category, which states which of the seven allowable categories your expenditure falls under. And once we review the actual template, you'll see that this Excel tracker actually only allows you to pick one allowable category from the dropdown list. And the dropdown list is pre-populated with the seven categories. The purpose of this is just to help you comply with grant requirements to only um, keep your expenditures within the allowable categories. And you will know there's gonna be instances where you have a single receipt, um, let's say from Walmart, with multiple allowable expenditure categories present on that receipt. And we've outlined all the details in the instructions, but in this case, you would just input one category under the expenditure category column and then input the remaining categories under the notes column, which is the last column of the template, and we'll get there. Um, and actually, we'll go through an example just like this so you can see what this will look like um, when it's populated. I do want to call out, though, that in the case of the printable expenditure tracker, you'll be able to handwrite as many categories in this column as you need to. Um, the next column is expenditure description where you'll input a brief description of the item or items you bought. And if you have multiple allowable expenditures on one receipt, we're asking you to describe all of them in this column. And this column doesn't have any pre-populated dropdown, so you're free to type there. The next column is amount. And this is simply the amount of money in US dollars that you expended for the transaction. 
again, in the case of multiple items on the same receipt, you just put the total amount. Um, don't worry about breaking down the cost of each item present on the receipt. The next column is account charged. So some of you might have financial statements or even just a general ledger where you classify expenditures by their type. So for example, if you buy cleaning supplies, this might just be categorized as supplies. And when you pay employees, this might be categorized as salaries and wage expense. If you don't have financial statements or a general ledger, you can simply think of this column as the type of expense. So similar to the expenditure category column, this column actually has a drop down list where you can only select one account at a time. And again, once we go through an example, you'll see this. Um, but our drop down list contains the most common accounts. So for example, the supplies and salaries wage expense we just talked about, but there's also an option for other. So if you select other, we're asking you to specify in the next column, um, account charged if other or multiple. Uh, in case there were multiple accounts charged, you would also write the other ones that weren't present within the account charge column. And again, if you're using the printable version, of course, you can just write each account um, under the account charge column rather than using the account charge if other or multiple column for this purpose. And just to remind you, the instructions are tailored for considerations like this. Next column is supporting documentation for expenditure. This column is where you type in the form of supporting documentation you have on record. So for example, if you made a purchase from Walmart, your supporting documentation would be a receipt. Or if you pay employee wages, your supporting documentation could be payroll checks. And you don't have to upload any supporting documentation to the tracker unless you would like to, um, but you should always have the supporting documentation readily available to prove each entry on the tracker. The last column is the notes column. And as we discussed before, in the case of multiple allowable expenditures on one receipt, this is where you put any other allowable categories that were not selected in the original expenditure category column. Aside from that, this column is just optional for you to input any additional information that might be helpful for you. And I wanna emphasize that this tracker, it's totally yours to help you comply with the grant requirements in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention on this tab is just the further items for consideration and the KPMG disclaimer, which we highly recommend you read before getting started. And Dominique, this is Evan. If I can just interject for a second, I, I think, you know, just in line with some of the questions we've been receiving also, I just thought it would be helpful to, you know, clarify that, you know, as, as Dominique has been mentioning, this tracker is a means of, um, of supporting you all and keeping track of what the expenses are that you're using these grant funds on. So it's not like this is not a template that specifically was sent down from the Fed, from the federal government, you know, meant for um, you know, co compliance in that aspect. This template's meant to be an easy way uh, as you all are spending the grant funds to just jot down some of the basic information aligned with it so that it's readily available, um, you know, should anybody inquire as to how the grant funds have been spent. So some of this basic information in here, just saying, you know, what kind of what did you buy and where did you buy it and who did you buy it from and you know what type of support do you do you have? Did you get a receipt or something like that? Uh, is just kind of a, a basic way that we thought would be helpful for you all just to quickly jot down some relevant details and then you know should anybody come looking for any more specifics on any one of these, you know, retaining that supporting documentation will be important to provide. Um, but again, you know, these are just you know the the recommended. Uh, fields that EEC, um, you know, would be hoping for the providers to keep track of for each of the different expenditures. So, you know, as Dominique mentioned, this this tracker doesn't have to be used. It, you know, the the elements are what I, I believe EEC would be looking for. If you have another way of tracking to, uh, however, most is convenient for you all. But these were we just wanted to share some of these specific fields that might be helpful, you know, along the way as you continue to use the grant funds. Thanks, Evan. I just want to jump in to add to that. If you do have a QuickBooks or some other financial accounting system, that is allowable as well. And so like Evan said, this is just another um, method of tracking if you don't have um, that type of um, financial system in place at your program. Thank you both for adding that. Um, so now if we want to move on to the transaction detail tab you can see what it'll look like when you actually fill out the details of your expenditure. And again, this tracker should only be used for expenditures made with child care stabilization grant funds. And if you wanna use this tracker for regular business practice, we totally encourage that. 
but make sure to keep the child care stabilization grant funds um, in a separate tracker. You'll see here in the top left corner that the tracker is asking for the month and year. You should have a new tracker for every month, but I really want to emphasize that you should be filling out the tracker as you make each purpose. And as I said before, we know you're all like super busy, but try not to wait until the end of the month to populate all expenditures because you could risk forgetting the details. So now if we go to the next tab, we can see an example of a populated tracker. And I want you all to know before we get started on this, that whether you use the printable or Excel version of the tracker, you'll have this example to reference when filling out your own. So you'll see here in the top left corner where you need to put input the name of your organization and provider ID. If you don't know your provider ID, you can get this information from the lead portal. You'll then have to input your grant award received from the current month, as well as total grant awards received to date. And again, if you don't know this information, you should be able to view it on lead. So let's go through the first example. Um, the first thing you'll notice here is that the date added to the tracker and the date expense paid was the same. So as I emphasized before, it's best practice for you to add expenditures to the tracker as they occur. The next column is expenditure category. And you'll be able to see here that when you click this column, you can only select from the allowable expenditures. Um, yes, perfect, thank you. The one inputted here is past expenses. And then the next column is a brief description, rent due for January, 2021. And the next column is simply the amount paid for rent. The account charged is rent expense. And you'll be able to see here again, in column G, the drop down where you can only pick from the list of common accounts. The supporting documentation here is simply a copy of the rent check. And because this is a relatively straightforward expenditure, there's no notes needed in the last column. Now I'm not gonna go through every example, but I do wanna call out some specific things. The second example shows how to fill out the tracker if you have multiple allowable expenditure categories on one receipt. So you'll see in the expenditure category column here, one category was selected from the drop down, but then the next column, expenditure description, lists two items cleaning supplies and educational books. And these are two different allowable categories. If we go to the last column, notes you'll be able to see that the allowable expenditure category not listed within the original expenditure category column is stated here in the notes column. And again, if you're using the principal version, you can just write both categories in the box, but make sure to stick only to the allowable categories. Um, one more thing I wanna call out, just skipping to the last example, is I want to draw attention to the account charged column. Since other was selected here, the next column, account charged if other or multiple, specifies the name of the account. The notes column then explains what the miscellaneous account is used for. So that wraps up the expenditure tracker walkthrough. Um, again, as we stated before, the expenditure tracker is not required, but very highly suggested to help keep yourself in the best spot possible in case of state or federal review. So now I know I covered a ton there, just a reminder that we do have the Q&A box, but we're also gonna have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So now we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint and we'll start discussing the importance of attestation. Awesome, thank you. So first of all, what is an attestation, right? An attestation is just simply a guarantee that something is true. And this is relevant to you all because as you know, part of the Child Care Stabilization Grant Program requires you to make multiple attestations in order to complete the grant application. EEC and the federal government expect you to be able to provide documentation that supports the attestations you make as part of the application. So because of this, you should verify during each application cycle that you are still in compliance with each attestation present on the grant application. If you find that you're no longer in compliance with one or more of the attestations, then you need to take the necessary steps to comply before applying for grant funds again. 
And to do this, you might actually find it helpful to turn the list of application attestations into a personal checklist for you to review and confirm compliance with each individual attestation before agreeing to them all. Thank you. Um, so this page should look familiar because this is what you would test to during each grant application cycle. The first attestation is your agreement to spend grant funds only on one or more of the allowable expenditure categories. And as you all know, you should check each category you plan to spend funds on once you receive grant funds for that application. I wanna call attention specifically to the last box on the bottom here with the red asterisk. This box states that you're allowed to move funds between categories without EEC's approval, but you must maintain documentation to support the use of funds, which we've talked about previously. Um, so the next set of attestations present on the application requires you to meet the following requirements. And again, I'm sure you're all familiar with these, but I'll just read through briefly. When open and serving children, you will implement policies in line with corresponding regulatory authorities, as well as try to implement policies in line with guidance from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC. The next one states, for each employee, you must maintain pay levels and benefits. And as we discussed earlier, remember you can always increase your employee's compensation, but you cannot decrease their compensation or for, or for excuse me, for low employees. The third one states you'll try to provide relief from your organization's co-payments and tuitions for families of children being, children being served, especially those struggling to make payments of either type. And the last attestation states you are currently open and actively enrolling children. So now that we've reviewed these items together, um, I'm going to pass it off to Caitlin to discuss internal controls. Thanks so much, Dominique. So now we're gonna talk about internal controls. I noticed at the beginning, only about 3% of you were excited about it and that is fine. I don't take it personally, but I'm hoping by the end of this that uh, more of you will be glad that you learned about internal controls today. So internal controls, what are they? They're activities and processes that are used by management to help an entity achieve its objectives. And this seems a little bit like a broad definition, right? That's pretty intentional because internal controls can take a lot of different forms and can be used for a lot of different purposes, which means that it's for everyone. Why implement internal controls? Well, they help your child care provider, your organization work better. Your operations will run more efficiently and effectively. It can help prevent or detect problems or identify problems if, um, sooner if an issue does occur. It can reduce possibilities of mismanagement and error, and it can help you comply with applicable laws and regulations. You can think of this like checks and balances. Um, you know, I personally like to think about internal controls similarly to like or an organization's culture, right? So there's a piece of culture or internal controls for all of us to play. If it's something that only starts at the top or the people on the ground are trying to, you know, keep the internal controls um, moving only, it's hard to see it through. It's something that everyone has a role to play um, and it requires internal communications. And that's where these processes also come in um, to help really uh, solidify these internal controls as part of the way that your organization operates. So on the next slide, what, um, we are going to give some examples of how this might be applicable specifically the work you're doing with the child care stabilization grant funds. So one example is a process to help ensure accurate and timely recording of transactions. So Dominique just went through that expenditure tracker. Um, and that's the type of thing that may fall through the cracks if you don't develop a process or a way to make sure it gets done. So personally for me, one strategy that works really well, especially if it's not something that I'm the most excited about doing is having an email, like my Outlook, or if you use Google, um, the Google suite, the Google calendar also has this, where you can have a reminder that pops up and says, you know, let's say you wanna do it by the 18th of the month. You can have it remind you on the fourth of the month, two weeks early and every week from there, remind you, hey, 
um, set a recurring reminder, record those transactions or however fre frequently you wanna do that. You know, going back to that checks and balances idea, you could have more, two or more staff members if you have the team and the capacity, right, to review the recorded transactions for accuracy, especially if you're manually typing things in, it's easy to, you know, have one extra zero added in, which will, of course, mess up everything, right? So having more than one set of eyes can be really helpful. Um, the same idea goes as well for having multiple designated staff members to review financial statements. Again, we know that this may not be possible for every um, child care provider, but to the extent it is, it's a really good idea. In addition, you know, these processes can include appropriate documentation of transactions and the policies themselves, right? So if you come away for, with this and you say, we need more internal controls, really want to make this a priority, and the, what you develop, either you don't develop something on paper or you don't distribute it, then it's gonna be hard to carry it through throughout your organization. So, you know, Dominique mentioned earlier the idea of a checklist, turning those attestations to a checklist. That could be a great internal control where you develop that checklist, one, and two, you say, before we submit the grant, we're going to make sure that that checklist is met. That's a really concrete example of an internal control you could deploy related to this, um, related to this grant. In addition, you want to periodically verify all your documents are complete, accurate, and protected from unauthorized access. On the next slide, we have some more examples for you, including processes that may help reduce the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and soon, Julia will also talk a little bit more about fraud, waste, and abuse, but to give you a bit of a preview, some of the ideas can be to require approval from two or more staff members before the grant fund expenditures are made, ensuring that staff responsibilities support segregation of duties. So it's not just one person who has all the power and the responsibility around um, your organization's monetary transactions and processes. You may already have this in place. I think it's relatively standard for some organizations. If it's a big check that's going out the door, maybe your uh, either chief financial officer in name or in, in title or in just function, maybe you have someone else um, that's required to sign off on a check, that would be an example. And again, having these processes laid out and reviewed and confirmed to help ensure that they're readily being followed and that they're able to be followed. It's the type of thing that you want someone else to look at before you deploy because it may make sense to you, but it needs to make sense for everyone if everyone's going to uphold these internal controls. And then on a very concrete level, protecting physical security of assets such as property, equipment, and inventory. If you're keeping physical files, making sure those filing cabinets are locked. If your records are digitized, then installing proper information technology security measures. Maybe that's having something encrypted or password protected or looking at who can access what files um, virtually through um, your computer system and your organization. Continuing on, on the next slide, what should you do once internal controls are implemented, right? So now what? You should ensure that these controls are documented in your organizational policies and that staff are aware of these responsibilities for managing grant funds. I can't emphasize this one enough, right? How often um, can things, you know, there's, y'all are really busy things, you know, there's so many kids who need the care and we, as an aside, just thank you for everything you're doing for, for our communities. It's so, so, so important. And you're juggling that with grant documentation. So making sure that you're talking about that, that you're aware of the responsibilities, maybe building it into um, a weekly or a monthly staff meeting um, or communications. If there's checklists, just building it in, kind of plugging it in there as much as possible so it doesn't get lost in all of the important work that you're doing. You want to review these policies for relevance and effectiveness on a regular basis, at least annually, and especially when key procedures are added or when new employees join the team, right? So you know way better than I how much your work has changed over the past two years and within the two years as well. And so um, let's say a new grant, let's say that um, 
let's say that a new grant is announced, you know, this is a little bit outside of the scope of this, but every time something is new, new is announced or another detail. So like, let's say today's webinar and training. So we're introducing this expenditure tracker. You're gonna take this back. It's going to be available for download on lead. Maybe from this, we hope that you'll identify additional internal controls or processes. So even though, you know, this may be more than your annual cadence, something has changed, new information, new resources are available, and you'll want to build that into your processes. And then if deficiencies are identified, that happens. The most important thing is to identify them and then do something about it and take that corrective action if needed. And then finally, encourage that continuous improvement to existing internal controls and monitoring. So unfortunately, it's not a one and done type of thing. Just like your organization and every day, you know, your child care provider is a living, breathing thing. Things change all the time. So as such, you need to keep revisiting it and identify ways um, to, to improve and make it better. And again, it's to help. It's not at odds with your goals. It's to help achieve the goals that you're really trying to look for here. Now, you may be receiving grant funds from multiple sources, which is totally okay, but there are some things you'll need to do about that. So you are allowed to receive grant funding from multiple sources, but it's important to ensure these funds are being tracked separately. If they do overlap, if you're not able to demonstrate that the funds are being spent on allowable purposes, you're gonna have a problem. So you just need to make sure um, that each specific grant requirement is met for each grant that you're using. So what should you do if you're receiving funds from multiple grant programs? You should definitely document the amount of funds received from each source and keep it on file for your reference when considering proper use of funds. And when I say keep it on file, I mean make sure you can find it. And that can be a huge challenge in and of itself, right? You can have the best, most organized spreadsheet with all of the detail. And if you can't figure out where you put it, that's going to be a challenge. So it's not only about documenting, it's about being able to find it. And I think you'll hear that be a theme later in the presentation as well. You want to review the terms of each grant program to make sure you understand the allowable and non-allowable uses of the grant funds. And then finally, this goes into, um, you know, the communication about um, who is receiving what funds and how you work together, what internal processes are in place. So I want to give you an example of something that could happen. So let's say to keep numbers nice and round, you have $10,000 worth of payroll expenses in a given month. And in that month, you were able to get the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP as it's sometimes called, um, funds for $4,000 worth of payroll. That's great. That leaves $6,000 worth that you don't otherwise have covered by a grant. So as you know from today's presentation and, and hopefully before as well, payroll is absolutely an allowable expense for the child care stabilization grant. So what you could do is you could log into LEAD and you could get your $6,000. So you have your four from the PPP, you have the six from the um, child care stabilization grant and that equals 10, the total of your um, payroll expenses. Isn't that ideal that, that these grant funds cover all of it? The issue becomes, let's say, making up names here, Sarah does the PPP and asks for four, and Lucy does the child care stabilization grant and they ask for seven, then you have four plus seven, that's 11. So that exceeds your total payroll expenses. And that's where you have a problem because you can't have expenses that um, are less than the amount of money that you're receiving. The grants are designed to cover your expenses, not to exceed them. And so it's making sure that those rules are understood that your two folks are talking to each other. And that's again, where these processes come into play, that there should be a step perhaps written down in, um, in the process, whether you're, when you're applying for funds or whatever makes sense to you, for folks to get together for everyone who's claiming grants on payroll to talk to each other and make sure that, um, that the rules are being followed. So that's a bit of an example of, of what to do, both internal controls broadly and specifically when you're receiving grants from multiple sources. Next slide, please. Great. So this reinforces what I um, was just describing. So you wanna segregate your funds from different grant sources, whether it's separating checks or depositing the funds in different bank accounts. Um, that does not mean seg segregating the conversations, right? You need to be talking to each other across grants, even if they're being tracked separately. And you could even argue because they're being tracked separately, the communication side of it is really important. 
When you're populating the expenditure tracker or whatever you're using that's similar, make sure to only include funds received from the grant program if, if you're tracking it specifically for this grant program. And then, you know, implement internal controls so staff don't try to claim expenses already covered by another grant. So that was the payroll example I, I gave earlier. With that, um, we're going to turn to the next slide and I'm going to hand it back to Julie to talk about fraud, waste, and abuse. And I'll be back for the, the Q&A in a bit. Thanks, Galen. Okay, so now we're going to discuss some, expand upon fraud, waste, and abuse. And Caitlin touched on it um, a little bit. And some main takeaways is that we would like to obviously reduce the overall risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. And some things that we've, these are some suggestions we've listed um, that could be helpful for you to help reduce fraud, waste, and abuse in your organization. So some things um, I'm going to mention is um, keeping complete and organized supporting documentation for all your financial transactions. I think that's definitely been a theme in this presentation about maintaining the documentation and also making sure that you're able to find it. Um, that's very important. Um, if you have multiple people in your organization, it's always great to discuss um, if you have the time to be able to see if there's any risk to fraud in your organization. And potentially, if you do identify any risk, are there ways that you can mitigate um, these risks? And really, it's also important to periodically check um, your internal controls, um, if they're working for you, um, if they're efficient, if they're applicable. And we understand you guys are all very busy. So these are definitely some things to not do every day, but really periodically check in um, and making sure that that's moving smoothly just so you can reduce the overall risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, so next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about fiscal monitoring. Um, and so what is fiscal monitoring? It's the review process that EEC is going to use to help ensure that the grant funds are being used correctly. And the purpose of fiscal monitoring is to ensure that your organization, you have the processes and documentations in place to success, successfully comply with the grants requirements. Um, some things we want to note is that e, EEC, or its designee, which will be us, KPMG at this time, is going to conduct the fiscal monitoring over the use of the grant funds. And so if you've ever re received grant funds from EC or any other government agencies before, you've likely been through fiscal monitoring. Um, and we just wanted to emphasize that fiscal monitoring, it shouldn't be anything scary. It's a great opportunity for partnership and learning together. Um, so we really wanted to highlight that. Next slide, please. So something else to note is that fiscal monitoring is not voluntary. Um, it is required and EC or its designee us um, in this case is going to notify you if you're selected for a review. There's gonna be no unannounced visits or requests. You will know if you are selected. The notification will also include if the review is gonna be conducted in person or remotely, so you will know. And then also, since there's a large number of grantees who have received funds, these reviews are going to be ongoing. So just want to emphasize those couple points that it's not voluntary and you will be notified. Um, it's not going to be unannounced. And also you will, you will be let known if it will happen in person or remotely. So next slide, please. So what might you see a part of this fiscal monitoring program? So some things you might see might include requests for documentation showing that expenditures made with the grant funds um, were used in compliance with uh, allowable uses. Um, you might be asked to complete some questions asking about general provider information. You might be asked about your uh, accounting systems and processes in place, um, your internal controls in place, and it's possible you might also see a report from EEC or us letting you know the results of the fiscal monitoring activities and any recommendations for improvements um, if necessary. And ways to prepare for this process is, um, I think this has been a huge theme of this training session today, is 
really document all your expenditures made with the grant funds. Um, we heavily recommend using the expenditure tracker, which we have met, talked about previously, um, and it will be uploaded to LEAD. Or if you have another tool as well that is similar to the expenditure tracker, but contains um, at least the elements found in the expenditure tracker, such as the date of the expenditure, um, where it was purchased, if applicable, um, also what it was used for and how much um, was spent. So if, you know, if it was used for salaries or it was used for payroll, there's not necessarily going to be a location, but make sure to keep the minimum elements of the expenditure tracker in whatever um, document you use to track the, um, your uh, expenditures using the grant funds. Okay, next slide, please. So again, what should you do to prepare? Retain all documentations um, supporting your expenditures. Also, um, it is suggested to document significant conversations and correspondence. So if you're talking back and forth in email, um, make sure to save that email, don't delete that email. If you keep meeting minutes or you have someone that does that, um, that is also very good to keep. And if you have the ability to keep meeting minutes, we also recommend that as well. Um, and definitely identifying and assessing potential ways to improve internal controls, um, specifically those related to documentation of expenditure, which um, were previously discussed by my colleague, Caitlin. Some things to know, um, in cases of potential non-compliance, EC will work with programs with appropriate and required solutions. And additionally, if you have more questions about additional guidance, um, we're including um, several slides of resources and additional information that you can go back and look at from government agencies, um, EEC, federal and state regulations as well. And we also want to emphasize and request that you do not send EEC or its designee KPMG any sensitive or data or personal identifiable information in the documents. Um, so please. We wanted to emphasize that at this moment. So next slide, please. So now we're gonna discuss and show you some resources and additional information. We also wanted to let you guys know that we will be having office hours. If you wanna ask any follow-up questions um, that we discussed today or any um, related to grant compliance, here you can join us at the below dates and times so this Wednesday, March 30th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, Friday, April 8th, next week, 1 to 3 p.m., or the following week, Tuesday, April 12th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So we encourage you to come if you have follow-up questions, um, and we will be there to answer the questions that you have. But we've also listed resources from EEC, from their YouTube channel, um, from the Child Care Stabilization Grant website, uh, frequently asked questions, and also we've um, included the link to lead as well. So next slide, please. So again, we've included more grant requirement resources, um, Massachusetts Supplemental Budget. We have um, the American Rescue Plan Act. We also have Federal Office of Inspector General, Pandemic Response, Response Accountability Committee. These are all um, resources of regulations um, and organizations that um, you can uh, reference um, and they provide more information um, and light on what we've discussed previously. So next slide, please. Again, more resources, please feel free to access these websites um, and they have more detailed as well um, that we've included in this presentation. So next slide, please. Um, this is a disclaimer, uh, you can read it your own time. So now, next slide. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Alicia for some questions. Thank you, everyone. All right, we've received some great questions thus far. So thank you all for um, keeping the Q&A box so lively. Um, so let's get started. I'm gonna actually go through, we have some frequently asked questions that I'll go through um, first. And these are the questions you will actually receive 
once we release the PowerPoint, the recording, um, and in, any other supporting document, any other handouts that we have available for this training, the expenditure tracker, all this will be sent to you as well as put on the EEC website. So um, along as, with this FAQ. So one of the questions is, I agree to the C3 grant attestations every month. What documentation do I need to prove these attestations? And so we respond to that within the grant attestations, you attest to using the funds at, for at least one of the allowable categories. Um, the supporting documentation must be retained to demonstrate that expenditure falls within that allowable category. Um, and so that documentation would include, and again, we have the expenditure tracker to help you with that, as well as if you have a financial system in place. Um, so I saw people asking if QuickBooks, if Quicken was good, all those um, uh, financial systems are, um, would be viable systems to help, you know, track the date of the transaction, the general description of what was purchased, the vendor that was actually used if applicable and the dollar amount. Um, and so what we would be looking for are receipts, um, some paid invoices, um, your payroll records to um, confirm, you know, payroll expenses. So if you did go to Amazon, use Amazon, um, which is an easy way to get some program supplies. If you went to Walmart, it would be those receipts that you would um, present when it, upon requests for a supporting documentation. Um, let's see. So what is the next question is, what is the expenditure tracker? Where do I find it? How do I use it? Um, and so the expenditure tracker is a template that will help track the transactions if you do not have some sort of a financial system. Um, could be made for the grant award. I know a lot of questions was why wasn't this provided for um, prior to the start of the grant? We were working to develop um, some sort of a monitoring for this program. We were doing pre-monitoring work um, and then we started the post-monitoring work um, in January. And then the, you know, as we were going through, we saw that more technical systems may be needed for programs who may not have a financial system in place. So the expenditure tracker was developed. Um, and so, you know, what we'll do is this video, will, this recording will be made available so that you can go back and see how to utilize the expenditure tracker, but we, we will put it up in lead. Um, and then we'll have the instructions are included in the tracker. Another question, yes, yeah, so uh, they, KPMG did go over what is fiscal monitoring. So fiscal monitoring is a process where EEC will follow um, to review if you're using and documenting the use of grant funds correctly. Um, and so, as we mentioned, it will not be an unannounced visit. Some of you who are direct contract subsidy providers, you know how, you know, you know pretty much our process that we would notify you, we'd send an engagement letter um, to request a specific, what specific documentation we would request. Um, with this, one of the, the great things that we're going to do about uh, doing fiscal monitoring for this particular grant is LEAD is going to have some updates where they will add a dashboard under the grants management section. So when you go in, um, I think you guys are familiar, when you go in to apply for your grant, you go through LEAD and there's a grant management section. Within that section, we will also have a place for you to upload this documentation. Um, and so if you are selected, communication will go through LEAD as well as your, um, your documentation will be up uploaded in LEAD. I saw some additional questions. Well, how would I be selected? Is everyone going to be monitored? So one of the things that KPMG is working with EEC is to develop a risk assessment to um, determine which programs should be monitored um, and we would reach out to those programs. As you know, EEC is not a large company. Um, organization. We don't have a huge audit unit as of yet. Um, that's why we're working with KPMG with this work. There are about 6,000 of you programs who received this funding. So yes, we have to kind of determine based on a risk assessment who will be monitored of these funds. Um, and again, we would utilize LEAD to have that communication. Um, KPMG will be with us until the end of the fiscal year, and they're going to do what we call a pilot of the fiscal monitoring. And that will help us get a sense of, you know, what kind of documentation providers are utilizing, um, what type of tracking are they using? Is there a financial system? Um, so some of you, um, there are some programs who have agreed to do the pre-pilot monitoring. So we're thankful for those programs who will be uh, doing the pre-pilot monitoring. So we'll be reaching out to those programs within the next week or so 
um, to start this process. Um, and that will help those programs to give us some feedback on this particular method of fiscal monitoring. Um, so fiscal monitoring, I went over that. Um, I know the number one question you guys had, will this funding be um, available past June? Um, and so I did text our CFO just to kind of give some static language for the field. Um, and this question is dependent on legislative action. Funding will continue through June, at least. Future funding awaits further appropriation. So that's my response to you from our CFO in regards to funding, um, ongoing funding. All right, uh, let me take a look at some of these other questions that may, we may be able to ask um, on the call. Some of these questions we will have to take back. Um, we are looking into a closer, more defined definition on the, the, the what's considered minor renovations, major renovations, and some of the repairs. I saw some questions regarding upgrading your HVAC systems. So we want to make sure we give you a clear answer on those specifics. Some flooring was, was done, you know, renovations, you know, some minor repairs to playgrounds. So we want to make sure that we provide some information on that. Um, let's see questions on utilizing funding for overhead. Again, you have to utilize the funding within the allowable expenses. Um, and that includes, let's go back to the slides, um, payroll and salary and wages, rent, utilities, facilities, maintenance, and insurance, um, protective, personal protective equipment, cleaning and other health and safety practices, equipment and supplies, goods and services related to child care facility program and providers, including professional development, mental health services, and then also paying for past expenses incurred after January 31st, 2020, including COVID related debt. So um, it's within those categories where we, uh, where programs are allowed to spend. Uh, let's see if I can scroll through and see if yeah. there's anything else. Alicia, if I can just jump in briefly. Sure. Oh. Sorry, I can make sure y'all can see me again. Um, one of the common themes that we saw in the in the um, questions was about payroll. And I think part of this may have come from the fact that it was emphasized that under the requirements, you're not allowed to decrease pay. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to be, that you needed to have increased pay to use grant funds. Um, so if you maintained the same payroll amount, um, at the salary level or the hourly level, I think there was a question about if someone dropped their hours, correct me if I'm wrong, Alicia, but I think that as long as you're paying them at the same rate, which would adjust based on the amount they work, that that would be okay. Um, is that, um, and then that can totally be used. The, yeah. These grant funds can totally be used even if you didn't uh, end up being able to do pay increases. Yes. So just wanna make that really clear. Uh, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> Some of your questions are very specific. Um, one of the great things about Zoom, it does track all of your questions. And so what we'll do is try to categorize them into specific groups. So if there's a lot of payroll questions, we'll be sure to put them together. Um, this will help for our office hours um, so that we can answer them clearly and then put them into an FAQ um, specifically. But there were a lot of payroll questions um, that Caitlin just addressed. Um, there is a question about um, when when it, when do the grant funds have to ex be expended? Because you know we're, you may be receiving them every month, but you're not actually spending it every month. I'm actually waiting for the the actual date for that, so we may have that that answer during the office hours. Um, let's see what else do we have in the Q and A? Um, and anyone from KPMG, if you see anything that we could um, answer. Are the stabilization, stabilization grant funds taxable income? So if you are mainly like self, um, family child care providers who are self-employed um, that, and they, you know, continue, they receive those funds as their income and it, they, it would have to be reported on a tax. They do receive a 1099 uh, for center-based programs. You would work with your um, accountant on how um, that is, is categorized. Let's see. I have one other question while you keep going through those. I'll, we can trade off a little bit, Alicia, if that's helpful. Um, I'm gonna 
I think Mark asked this question really clearly, but it, it um, others have asked similar. So I'll just read his question. Can one month's payroll cover multiple months of grant proceeds? For example, if I receive 10,000 per month, but my payroll is 30 per month, um, you know, what happens there? And I think this can be true regardless of payroll or whether it's another expense. That seventh category is past expenses. So let's say you had a $30,000 um, cost in January. That is definitely one of those allowable uses. It could be payroll. It could be something else. Um, and you get 10,000 a month. Then in January, that 10,000 could go for the current months. And then February and March, the other 10,000, 20,000 total could go for a past um, cost that isn't an allowable use. And so the answer is yes, you can absolutely do that, Mark. Um, again, with the payroll, can I use all of my grant funds just for payroll? It is an allowable um, expenditure, so yes, you can. We did have a question at the top of the hour. Um, what does KPMG stand for? So, Caitlin, you wanna <laughs> tell the, the audience what KPMG actually stands for? And then a little bit about your organization may be helpful um, to the field as I'm looking through. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, so KPMG is a series of names. I, Klein, Kleinveld, Pete Marwick, and Gerd Diller. It's a, originally a, 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 a Dutch and company based out of the Netherlands, but we're KPMG LP US. So we um, operate independently mostly. And Dave is going to talk about this a little bit more because I'm actually relatively new to the firm and uh, I'll let Dave take it from here. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in my right, orientation. That was, that, was actually, that was actually pretty good, Caitlin. Uh, Kleinveld, Pete Mora, Girdler. Uh, I think the lineage that Caitlin explained uh, is, uh, is, is relevant. I think there's also some, some uh, German member firm background in there, but we are essentially a uh, a, a network of international member firms, the KPMG LLP US firm is the one that's serving or has the pleasure of serving EEC and you all as a result of this engagement. Uh, however, we have obviously member firms throughout um, uh, throughout the world and uh, we perform a, you know, related professional services of an accounting and advisory nature uh, for about 100 plus nations across the globe. So we're very happy to be working with EEC and this particular endeavor, but uh, that's a great trivia question that you can probably save for a little bit later on uh, and uh, and earn a lot of points with whatever game you're playing as a result. But yeah. hopefully that's helpful, Alicia. So Thank I you. I would just add too that we've been doing a lot of work related to right things like this that's funded related to COVID that as these things have been coming up, we've been trying to support um, EC and other entities specifically around like the, the COVID money as well. So happy to be here. Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about the pilot monitoring process, um, kind of step-by-step -step, um, as to what KPMG will be doing during this pilot monitoring phase, um, just to let the pro programs know that KPMG will start this process and then EEC will take over um, in the next fiscal year. But I want them to kind of hear from you guys so that when they, you guys do reach out, um, they are aware, yes, it is KPMG and they are working with EEC on the pilot monitoring. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely give you a preview of what's to come. Um, so I would say in terms of overall goals, it's to be no surprises, right? So we talked about how there's not going to be any spontaneous visits or anything like that, at least in this initial, uh, there will there will not be unannounced visits. And, um, and if there ever are to be visits, right, Alicia, that would be notified in advance. Um, and so we're going to start with with some communication. So the providers that are participating in the pilot um, will receive a letter and say, hello, you are going to be participating in this and we are going to ask for um, the record of, of how you've been using these grant funds. Um, and we'll give you a few different ways to, to do that. Our goal as well is to make this as simple as we can for you um, as well. So we're not, um, for example, we're not requiring, or EEC has made the decision and, uh, to not require the use of the expenditure tracker um, because you may, folks mentioned QuickBooks, Quick, and there's other things that you may be using. So we wanna um, make it as, as straightforward and, and, and seamless with what you're already doing um, to the extent possible. Um, from there, we will look at what you've sent and send a subsequent communication um, that will ask for backup documentation to support um, a few of the transactions you've made. So it'll probably be up to about seven of how you 
um, spent. So it may be, you said you use grant funds in January 2022 for payroll. Can you send us something that supports that? So we'll have examples, but it'll ask for things like um, maybe you have a payroll, um, like a record of your payroll, for example, and that could be used to show us that, yes, you did in fact use this money on payroll. Um, and then, you know, there will be follow up communication as needed. And then once that review is done, we're sharing um, the results with the EC. And then Alicia, I don't know if you have a, a timeline in mind or detail that you want to provide about what will happen next. But long story short, you'll get a couple of communications. We'll ask for some things. We'll look at it. We'll send you follow-up questions. Um, most of this, if not all, will be done through LEAD. Um, so it's a system that you're going to be familiar with. Um, and you'll be able to call the help desk or email the help desk like you have been throughout this process if you need additional support as well. Yes, thank you, Caitlin, for explaining that. Yes, yeah, so at, starting in um, fiscal year 2023, which would be after July 1st, um, 2022, EEC will um, start the process of standing up a um, grant monitoring team that will continue this work. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, so the process would be pretty similar unless you know we do decide to go on site to a program. Um, to do the, the review on site. Um, I know a lot of right now, you know, the audit unit is conducting the subsidy uh, monitoring and some providers have asked if, you know, on site be better because it's easier to have the files available um, instead of scanning and emailing and uploading. Um, so it would just all depends on the size of the program, the size of the, the grant funding, whether we'd be doing it through all through LEAD in virtual or coming on site to the program. So stay tuned, more information um, will be provided. So if you are selected, um, we will, as Caitlin, we will follow the similar process as Caitlin described. And, and just to emphasize too that, um, you know, it's a pilot, I don't want to speak for you, Alicia, but it's a pilot for a reason, right? So we can learn from this experience and as this is rolled out to more providers. So know that, you know, if you ask a question and we think, oh, we should have explained that, that we're going to update um, our communications or suggest it to EEC. And so it's definitely like we value you and your time and we'll be learning from you as you also learn from us. Right. Um, so again, the, the handouts, the, the recording and the PowerPoint remain available. I um, just want to just emphasize that I saw the question come back in again. Um, so the uh, for for your grant for grantees, you would still utilize the C3 grant stabilization grant um, help desk through MTX um, and that hotline. I think we do have that on the PowerPoint. So you wouldn't be contacting KPMG directly. Um, everything would flow through um, either lead um, or through the current help desk that you use for the grant. So let me see, do we have that listed? I think I, I can put it in the chat if people need that um, information right away. Um, so that wouldn't change. Um, I know there's another question. If you want to see how much you received thus far in grant funds, um, um, the MTX team did provide uh, some step-by-step -step process on how to take a look at what is um, all the funding that you've received thus far. Um, and actually, I'll just share my screen so you can see for yourself. Because you, you may recognize these screens here. Um, and so if you need to see a listing of your paid amount, obviously you would log into LEAD, you will go to the grants management dashboard, um, and then you would um, log into your program's opera grant page you would search the provider, especially if you are a um, umbrella with multiple programs, and then you will see the certification section. And so you would see the listing of the funding months, the action that was taken by the program, the funding distrib distribution status, whether we've already paid it um, or if it's scheduled and the amount. Um, so again, if you do have any questions, um, so this will help you if for number one, your expenditure tracking, so you know, okay, I've received all of these funds, um, and this is what I've spent it on. This will help kind of guide, start that process for you. Um, again, if you do need, need assistance, this is the MTX um, help desk line and the email address. Um, if you have any missing payments or if you have any questions, what they will do, um, any questions related to fiscal monitoring, um, they would um, send it over to the EEC team um, to provide a response to your program. So we wanna keep this centralized to the C3 stabilization grant. Um, so you wouldn't have to contact um, KPNG directly um, for this purpose. All right. 
Let's see. Let's see. Monitoring questions we've answered. Um, one other thing, actually, and, and um, if you did say this, then we can just um, emphasize it. There was a question about our phone number, but I think it was specifically around the office hours. So that yeah. was sent when you received the email, correct me if I'm wrong, Alicia, when, when you all received the email to register for today, um, and there was also a link to register for the office hours as well. Yes. So here are, we have office hours on Wednesday from 10 to 12. <clears throat> the next, then after that um, will be Friday, April 8th. And then we have one more last um, off to hour session on April 12th. There was also one more center-based provider um, training that we will be doing. And then we'll do the FCC provider training separately um, on next Tuesday evening. All right, I think we've gotten through the major questions. And as again, we will um, address some of your questions specifically um, during the office hours. We wanna make sure we put them into a, a FAQ where it is very clear the response to some of your questions. Um, I do see a question about for those who do fill out the uniform financial reports, um, is, is a requirement to report these funds. You guys, you guys are a sub award um, and NTX is actually our sub recipient. So you would not actually see this on your federal listing when you receive, when the, the federal listing is loaded up into the um, OSD database. So those who are um, subsidy direct contract providers um, will understand this language, but this is a sub award. So you wouldn't see this as a listing on your federal list, um, federal list. All right. Yep, and we will respond to the date when the grants have, the funds have to be extended, um, when the funds have to be um, end, and we will respond to the renovation questions. And I think for now that is it. So hopefully you will join us for the office hours on Wednesday, um, where we can address your questions. Um, anything else from KPMG? If not, we can end the webinar. I don't think so. Just thanks again for joining and have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Thank you all.